Good evening. My name is Paul Charnier. I'm the editorial page editor at the Day newspaper. I welcome everyone to the 33rd District Senate debate. I'd like to introduce the candidates. In the race this year in the 33rd District, we have the incumbent senator, Otlin Harris. And to his left is the Democratic challenger, the first electman of Essex, Norm Needleman. I'm joined uh, by uh, Brian Hallenbach, a day staff writer who uh, uh, writes primarily about uh, the casino and tribal matters and business interests, and by Lisa McGinley, recently retired from the day as our deputy managing editor, and she continues in her retirement to do some work for our opinion pages. The 33rd District covers the towns of Clinton, Westbrook, Old Saybrook, Essex, Chester, Deep River, Lyme, Haddam, East Haddam, Colchester, Portland, and East Hampton. This debate is being live streamed on theday.com. It will be an hour long debate. Uh, we ask that um, the audience remain quiet and respectful during the debate and hold their applause until the end. Uh, the debate is being sponsored by both the Day and the Chamber of Commerce of Eastern Connecticut. Uh, I'd like to thank the Lyme O Lyme Regional School District uh, for the use of this uh, nice auditorium and the League of Women Voters who will be providing of Southeastern Connecticut who will be providing our timekeepers. And I thank the audience uh, for coming out tonight. Uh, the, uh, we, we've received some questions from the public that we'll try to incorporate into tonight. How this will work is uh, questions will alternate between the candidates. Uh, the candidate getting the question will have a minute to respond. Then the other candidate will get 90 seconds for their response and rebuttal. And then it goes back to the person who took the question for another 30 seconds. And the uh, questions will alternate throughout the course of the debate. So with that, uh, we're going to go right to the questions. And the first question is from myself to Senator Linares. Uh, your opponent has said it was improper, perhaps illegal, for you to provide a New Jersey political consultant with private information from thousands of constituents who contacted your state senate office. He contends you used the information to set out fundraising requests and solicitations and campaign materials. Uh, what is your defense? Desperate people say and do desperate things. And that's exactly what Dan Malloy and the majority Demo of Democrats in Connecticut want us to focus on. They want us to focus on these desperate accusations instead of focusing on the solutions and the problems that we are facing in Hartford. We're facing a $1.3 billion deficit after six years of Dan Malloy and Democratic rule. We are losing jobs. $60 a second leaves Connecticut. We lost billions of dollars of wealth. And every day, we have businesses leaving this state. We have to focus on solving those problems. And I'm here tonight to talk about solutions to those problems, because we are tired of hearing from politicians that will do and say anything just to get elected. Thank you. And uh, you have 90 seconds, Mr. Needleman. Thank you. Um, when I found out about the FOIing of an email list that was uh, collected at the time um, the state was dealing with its budget shortfalls and coming up with a um, solution budget rescissions that were painful, discussions about cuts to educational cost sharing money. Senator Lenara sent out a petition to actually collect names under the guise of going to hand that petition to Dan Malloy. That petition um, was collected, a number of names were collected, and that was then FOI'd by his campaign person. I have uh, been a first selectman for quite a while, I, when I first got into office, I started a newsletter for the benefit of the residents of our town. It would never occur to me to FOI that email list for the purpose of uh, funding my campaign 
or reaching out inappropriately to my constituents. So whether it's illegal or just not right, it speaks to the kind of politics that Senator Linares was just discussing as being wrong. I have been a business leader, a municipal leader for a long time, and those thoughts would not even occur to me. That move to me was a, an example of being a professional politician, and I am not that. And uh, your response, Ms. Linares, you have 30 seconds. And I know you want to talk about the issues, but if you could perhaps address the, yeah. uh, the, the issue so, that's being so, raised. So four years ago, they said that I was too young. Two years ago, they said that I was poisoning children. This year, they're talking about emails that folks can unsubscribe to. And actually, if you want to know about what's really happening in Hartford, please sign up to my emails at reelectartlinaris.com. I'll tell you what's really going on. What they don't want to talk about are the issues, because they don't have one-party rule, the Democrats, and one-party rule under Dan Malloy. They don't have solutions to our problem. I do. I'm ready and to stand and fight for you in a comp for a confident future for our state. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Lisa McGinley, and it's to Mr. Needleman. Mr. Needleman, in the 2014 election, Governor Malloy received $6.5 million in state money through the Citizens Election Program, a program intended to keep special interest money out of campaigns. Yet the Democrats and the governor turned around and raised money, which was prohibited under state law, by using federal election laws. Was your party wrong, and shouldn't they release all communications that led to their strategy to use the federal law? So I am uh, not fully versed on that issue, but I would say that I support the Citizens Elections Program. I think that it's gone a long way to removing money out of politics in the state of Connecticut, and I think that that's terrific. I know that uh, my opponent's party would like to gut the Citizens Elections Committee. Um, the former representative uh, from uh, my district, State Representative Jamie Spallone, who's now the Deputy Secretary of State, was one of the leading forces in getting that into place. So um, I don't know the specifics. I know there's an ongoing investigation. I'm very interested in hearing the outcome of that to see if there was any illegality um, that happened. But uh, I would say that the Citizens Election Program is one of the things that I'm most proud of as a resident of the state of Connecticut, and I believe that it's a good program for us. It's not perfect. It never will be perfect. Um, anytime somebody tries to do something, there are unintended consequences, and I'm sure that there, there are loopholes that people exploit all the time, just like the FOI laws, which were not intended. All right. Uh, thank you. If, and again, if our candidates could keep an eye, the timekeepers will give you prompts when you have, uh, uh, you're running out of time and there'll be stops. Thank you. Uh, Senator Lin Linares, you have up to 90 seconds to comment on the issue. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that's a federal investigation that is an issue you have to talk about and it and the the concerns about the emails when we have a mileage tax when the governor is under a federal investigation it's clearly just a distraction now the the citizens election program is running a deficit year after year republicans in the senate have proposed fully funding mental health instead of us getting eight million dollars a year so that we can send mail for a campaign. I think you should raise the amount that you can raise per donation and raise your own money instead of us taking state money to run our campaigns so we can do things like fully fund uh, mental health care in this state. So um, to, just to clarify, so would you would you do away with the citizen election program, no more public financing of campaigns? Are you talking about reducing the amounts of money? That I, I think we should. I think right now with our current fiscal crisis, uh, we should encourage uh, candidates to raise their own money by lifting the cap, elevating the cap that candidates can raise per donation because right now you cannot run a competitive race in this state unless you take the citizen's election program. That will help really help us really have clean, clean elections in Connecticut. Thank you. And then uh, you have uh, up to 30 seconds uh, for a final comment on this issue, Mr. Needleman. 
Well, I, I um, can only say that that's an absurd and ridiculous statement. That in the end, um, that's why the citizens election program was put into place because Citizens United opened the floodgate for money and public financing for state elections has proved to be a, love, a play, playing field leveling thing that has worked well. Um, so I, I think that going back to trying to raise money and reaching out to special interests is a terrible idea. All right, thank you. And uh, the next question is from Brian Hallenbeck to Senator Linares. Senator Linares, in 2015, you supported the bill that authorized the Mashantucket, Pequot, and Mohegan tribes to form a joint venture to solicit third casino site proposals from municipalities. Now, as you know, that, that process has been extended recently by the tribes. Before a third casino can be built, the state must legalize commercial gaming. Mm -hmm. How will you vote on such a bill? And should casino expansion be limited to the two tribes? The reason why there is such a rush for us to develop a third casino is because MGM is building a casino in Massachusetts, and they plan to attract quite a few visitors and tourists uh, to that casino. And as a result, Connecticut will have a net loss of 50 to 100 million dollars per, per year. So the purpose of this bill, of this piece of legislation that was passed, that I supported, was to build a casino to intercept those tourists going to Massachusetts. This would create jobs in our state, this would protect jobs in the current casinos, and this would be a, a net gain for our economy. I do not believe that we should rely on casinos to grow our economy. We should be looking to, to reduce our tax rate, to in, encourage economic growth in this state organically, encouraging entrepreneurship. All right. Thank you, Senator Linares. Um, Mr. Needleman, you have up to 90 seconds. So I would um, be very clear and say that I would not support expansion of commercial gaming in the state of Connecticut. Um, I think we have enough casinos. I think casinos are prop, you know, sprouting up all over the country, and I'm not sure the net benefit to them um, has been demonstrated. However, we do have two exceptional casinos in the state, and I would rather see that money um, go to um, enhance their own operations as opposed to opening up a new one every time the idea of competition comes up. Uh, so, uh, but Senator Linares just said two different things at the same time. He, he said he wants the casinos that, they, that are there to keep um, their own uh, jobs and yet he supports the opening of another casino. He also talked about finding um, ways to reduce taxes. I just think that uh, promoting gambling in the state of Connecticut, um, although I'm not into outlawing every vice that there is, but promoting that as the basis of tourism in the state of Connecticut, even though it's already the largest tourist industry in the state, not where I would spend my tourist dollars, not where I would give my tax breaks, I would look to find other ways um, like the Valley Railroad in my town or the Mystic Seaport or other things that we can do, theaters, arts, to promote tourism. I think we have enough casinos. Uh, your response, Senator Linares, you have 30 seconds. Yeah, it has nothing to do with promoting tourism. That's a totally different line item in the budget, so you should probably study that. It has to do with intercepting visitors to the casino in Ma the new casino that's planning on being built in Massachusetts. And yes, it is a net gain of jobs in Connecticut. That's why the local casinos and the folks that work there reached out to us to, su to support this proposal. And we do need to support to tourism in this state through digital media, through marketing, through being smart about how we advertise the Connecticut River Valley, and that's something I've been focusing on and started thank the Connecticut Tourism Caucus. Thank, thank you, Senator. Um, uh, I'm going to give uh, Senator Linares another 30 seconds. I'm going to ask him another question just to follow up. Um, you didn't answer the part of the question um, 
should a casino expansion be limited to the two tribes or in a free market should anyone be able to compete to build uh, this third casino um, yeah obviously mr. Needleman we know the answer he, he does not support another casino so if you could could you address that uh, you know in 30 seconds it should there? be limited to the two tribes we should focus on building this on on building this development to intercept uh, the tourists that are planning on going to the casino in Massachusetts. If we don't, like I said, it's a hundred fifty to $100 million net loss annually to Connecticut, and it's a net loss in jobs as well. Uh, Ms. Needleman, do you want to say any more on that before we move on to the next question? No, not really. Okay. Um, and the next question is to you on another topic. Um, in March of 2016, the state faced projected $220 million deficit. By a 33 to 3 vote, the Senate approved a plan to fix it. Uh, one of the guys who voted against it was your opponent. He was among that three. The fix didn't work, uh, so was Senator Linares right or wrong in voting as he did, in your opinion? Well, actually, it's, a, it's kind of a funny story because that uh, vote was uh, sort of the thing that pushed me over the edge in wanting to run for this office. I was um, at um, the wake of former first selectman or deceased first selectman Dick Smith, and I was talking to s someone else in the legislature who um, uh, was talking about that bipartisan vote, and um, and he, uh, I asked him who voted against it, and and he told me, and I was like perplexed. I mean, I understand that we have much, a much broader problem uh, with our budget, but that was an attempt, a bipartisan attempt to solve problems. I am all about reaching across the aisle, finding people to work with, coming up with bipartisan solutions, because retreating to this nonsense of the Democrats did this and the Republicans did this and one, it's just ridiculous. There's a lot of blame to lay to people's feet but we need to solve the broader problem. There, were no, there was no money to pay the bills the next day. You had to vote for something. You had to stand for something. All right, I'm gonna have so, to cut you off. If, again, if the candidates keep an eye out, we have time to keep it, so I don't have to do it. You can okay. kind of uh, moderate yourself. Thank you. Uh, Senator Linares, uh, your comment about that, that vote? Yeah, and first I'd like to thank David Collins, who wrote a very nice article after that vote, uh, because I stood up against that budget because the following day I knew that it would be in deficit. The people of Connecticut deserve a balanced budget when the legislature assembles and votes. That budget had $200 million of overtime. That budget was in deficit the very next day. We didn't make the kinds of structural changes that we needed to make as a legislature to solve the problems, not just for uh, the following year, but for five, 10 years down the road. We can't just budget for tomorrow, we have to budget for future generations as well. So that was a time for structural changes, that was a time for pension reform, that was a time to get serious about making our government more efficient and more effective. And I'm proud that I stood against that budget and all of Dan Malloy's and the, Democrats, the Democratic majority's budgets in Hartford since I've been there. Uh, please, no applause during the, uh, during the debate. Uh, thank you. Uh, you have 30 seconds or final word on this, Mr. Needleman. I'm going to watch her this time. <laughs> so um, back in high school, I was called a master of the obvious by a teacher who um, I thought actually it was a compliment, and it wasn't. Um, uh, Senator Linares' comments here um, uh, demonstrate that he's a master of the obvious. We all know now that there's a need for structural reform. And when he voted either for or against the uh, two-year budget, that's when it needed to be addressed. In the 11th hour, with deficit spending um, facing us with the need to shut down government, that was not the moment to take that stand. It needed to be taken. Um, and again, that's what I plan on doing. Thank you. Um, our next question uh, is from Lisa McGinley and to Senator Linares. Senator Linares, the state Supreme Court agreed this week to hear the Attorney General's appeal of Judge Thomas Mukauscher's decision 
to require a more equitable way of funding the public schools. That means the General Assembly is no longer facing a March deadline, uh, which had been imposed by the judge, to come up with solutions. Nevertheless, should the House and the Senate begin work on a new system of funding education or await a Supreme Court ruling? Either way, what changes would you advocate in the way local schools are funded? First, I don't believe that the judge should be legislating from the bench. Uh, it's important that we, res we respect the balance of powers. Being on the education committee, I have fought so that to fully fund education uh, specifically for our local school districts. When we found out that Governor Malloy was cutting $1.4 million to the town of Clinton, Representative McLaughlin and I got signatures throughout the town and we were able to stop that cut. And it's well known that the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate use education funding as a means of twisting arms of politicians to get them to vote for the Democrats' budgets. That's not right. We shouldn't be using the future, the, the funds for education, the future of our children as a, as a means of political arm twisting. So yes, the legislature must find a fair and concise way to fund education. We owe it to our children. Mr. Needleman. Thank you. So um, there are some points in what Senator Lenara said that I agree with. I, I don't believe that we should be legislating from the bench on this, but I think that the judge was trying to make a statement that um, we have a problem that's been facing the state. The lawsuit that um, he uh, rendered a decision on was 11 years old, and, um, and nobody has been able to do anything on it because as, as all of these problems come up, and you try to recreate how to fund things properly, you, have, you create winners and losers. Um, in Essex, we face, we deal with the uncertainty all the time of not having consistent funding or having it the 11th hour funds um, cut. Uh, so we want solutions. About a month and a half ago, the Connecticut School Finance Project um, came out with a 46-page report on fixing or trying to fix at least the special ed component of, um, of state education funding, which is a major portion of that. Um, and I read that plan, and I think that that plan has some very reasonable resolution or solutions in it. Um, I believe that every minute of every day should be sent, spent on fixing this problem because the towns can't keep functioning with a knife hanging over our head. Thank you. And uh, uh, last word on this goes to Ms. Linares. You have 30 seconds uh, for any further comment. We need to improve our formula for funding local school districts. In, in our district, in the 33rd, we have terrific teachers, terrific administrators, and they deserve to have predictability when it comes to understanding what their budget will be in the future, which is why we need to pass our budget first. It should be the first thing we do in Hartford so that towns can plan and so that, we, that, so that our kids know that they have the funds for education. Well, thank you. Uh, our next question is from uh, Brian Hellenbeck and it goes to Mr. Needleman. Mr. Needleman, on June 30th, uh, the last day of the previous fiscal year, the Malloy administration eliminated funding in the current fiscal year for the regional tourism districts, including the Eastern District. Supporters of that district have indicated they will seek restoration of at least some of that funding. How would you vote? And are you satisfied in general with the way this, with the state's approach to tourism promotion? Um, I have a vested interest in that because I, I live with somebody who runs a theater in the uh, district and um, and I believe uh, I hear it every night. <laughs> and she's a, the town of Essex's tourism rep to that tourism district. Um, I would love to tell people that we should fully fund everything. I would love to say that this is an easy um, problem to fix. But 
we need to find ways to fund some of these things with private dollars. Um, and I think that although Gov Governor Malloy did a great job in restoring $10 million to the tourism budget and the state's advertising budget when he first took office, the budget crisis we face is a, a real problem. And as Senator Linares aptly put it, we have to decide between mental health and promoting tourism or other critical functions. So choices have to be made and creative solutions need to be found. That's what I do. Uh, Senator Linares, you have 90 seconds. So when it, when it comes to investing in tourism, we have to do so, and we have to do it wisely. If you look at New York's tourism plan, uh, they have Jay-Z in the background singing New York, New York, Empire State of Mind. They're talking about the jobs that they're creating. They're, talk they're talking about the opportunities for people to come to New York to visit and to stay there. In Connecticut, we have commercials running saying it's still revolutionary and they're running in Connecticut. We're, we're already here. They should be airing those commercials somewhere else. And we need to get smart about how we market this state using digital media, using digital marketing, advertising, uh, collecting data appropriately and marketing to the folks that we want to come here. Uh, we can do a much better job and I haven't seen that in it with the Connecticut tourism, uh, with Connecticut tourism at this time. If you and if you could just, uh, you know, you, you were in Hartford. Uh, the the cutting of the funding for the tourism districts was was, yeah. was that re necessary given the budget situation? Or was that a poor decision well, to make? If you could comment on that. It's unfortunate because there was an increase in the hospitality tax, and that money was supposed to go. Uh, to market tourism. That's how they got the hospitality industry to agree uh, to that uh, new tax. And so it's another example of how a new tax is implemented. It's promised to be lockboxed for tourism or, for example, with the special transportation fund, money is promised to be lockboxed to transportation and then it's absorbed into the general fund. It's another example of how money is misused in Hartford and how it, we need to stop that. And Mr. Needleman, you get a final word on this one, uh, 30 seconds. Thank you. So I actually agree that money that should be earmarked for specific purposes or collected for those should be earmarked for them. Um, however, I've been, my whole life, I've been watching um, New York and Connecticut uh, earmark money like through the lottery for education and money always goes into the general fund. I actually think we have a spending problem in the state of Connecticut. We, we budget based on how much we want to spend and then we try to figure out where the money is. And frankly, both parties um, love to put things in the budget for their district, for their towns, and eventually it's just got to stop. You right. can't keep spending. Thank you. Uh, next question goes to Senator Linares. Uh, you have a successful solar energy business, uh, yet the presidential candidate for your party and many Republicans dismiss human influence climate change as a myth. Uh, Mr. Trump has said he will focus on fossil fuel production and, and renewable energy subsidies. Uh, do you support his positions, and will you be supporting Mr. Trump? <laughs> so, Hillary Clinton has taken more money from the oil and gas industry than Donald Trump has to date, number one. Number two, I believe in a comprehensive energy policy, an inclusive policy, a competitive policy towards energy. I believe that there should be the same tax credits available to all types of energy. Let's let them compete. And I, for one, believe that renewables will do very well in that competitive environment. Now, trust me, the, pre the candidates for president are not perfect. And I don't agree with ending all renewable energy subsidy, obviously. I'm a proponent for comprehensive energy reform. When it comes to the economy, Donald Trump has a plan to reduce corporate taxes. Hillary Clinton's plan 
is to raise taxes and I'm charge. Sorry, your time is up on this segment, but you will get you'll get another response as we go back and forth. So keep those thoughts. We'll get back to it for sure. Uh, Mr. Needleman, uh, you can certainly res respond to the question I asked Mr. Linares, but I think uh, voters might also like to know who you're supporting and why. And I, I'm, I'm 65 years old, and I've never seen an election like this. Um, but I have seen elections where the choice comes down to the lesser of two evils. We've had that in the past. I've been voting since 1972. Um, and, uh, and I support Hillary Clinton for president, um, albeit at times quite reluctantly. Um, I, I don't think that Senator Linares answered one of the key questions, which is who does he really support? He was a delegate at the convention for Donald Trump, and nobody dragged him there. The leader of his caucus did not go. Um, and I think Donald Trump stands for some horrible things that I, I, I know people who know him personally, he is not somebody who's qualified or fit to be president of the United States. Um, and I have to tell you categorically, I believe that human activity is affecting um, climate. So what I would say um, to, uh, to Senator Linares' uh, answer is that I do believe that uh, subsidies should be granted to businesses like his because I do believe we should be promoting renewable energy. I do believe we should have a strategy for phasing um, out of fossil fuels over time and equal tax breaks should not be given to all energy companies regardless of how much they pollute the environment. So I actually support your business and I think it's great that you're doing that. Um, I wish you did it with uh, buying U.S. solar panels, but be that as it may. All right, thank um, you. Um, and as promised, you got another 30 seconds, Senator Linares, and perhaps you could take that time to fill us in on who you'll be supporting. For yeah, absolutely. I'm voting for Donald Trump. And for uh, number one, I think that, I'm, well, I'm voting Republican down the line this year because I think our country and our state needs to change direction. I also, and when it comes to the economy, as I was saying, Donald Trump plans to reduce, reduce corporate taxes. We need to do that in America. We have some of the highest corporate taxes in the industrial, in the modern world. We have to reduce those taxes. Hillary wants to raise them and push businesses out. Donald Trump has a better plan to increase wages. He wants to use the earned income tax credit to increase wages. Hillary wants to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Right. That'll hurt small businesses. Gonna have to cut it off there to be fair with the timing. Uh, the next question uh, is from Lisa McGinley to Mr. Needleman. Mr. Needleman, with benefit agreements with state labor unions locked in through 2022, how can the legislature find the necessary labor savings to get the state budget under control? And would you also tell us what other ideas you have for restoring the state's fiscal health? Um, yeah, sure. I, I think that uh, contracts are contracts and they've been negotiated in good faith, all be they bad contracts um, in some cases. So I think we have to live with what we have or do our best to bring people um, in a voluntary way to the table because I don't think we can compel them to come to the table. I think the long-term solution um, to Connecticut's fiscal problem is going to be to grow the economy and to control spending. And as I've said, um, every legislator loves to put things for towns and their district in bills um, so that they can say they put them in their bills and, and that they support their town's efforts. So we spend money and then we try to figure out where to get it. I think that we need to control spending and grow the economy long term, but the devil's in the details on that, and it's not a 60-second answer. Well, maybe we'll give you, maybe we'll give a little more time. Um, so, Senator Linares, uh, uh, one, the issue about the contracts that are locked in until 2022 on the benefits, which um, should should there be some consideration trying to reopen those. And then your ideas uh, more broadly on how to address the state uh, budget uh, crisis. And you have 90 seconds. I think we should reopen those contracts. What we should do is start making changes to our pension plan from 2022 and beyond, shift it to a defined contribution plan. Only 25% of state employees contribute to their pension 
and, what, and the ones that do contribute 2%. We have, that is the lowest contribution in the country. Our, our pension plan is 45% underfunded. We have a $70 billion liability. Mathematically, the system is going to break unless we make a change. New employees, new state employees, should contribute more of their annual salary to their pensions. And current state employees have to be open to negotiating, contributing more as well. That way, we, they will have retirement security. They will know that their pension will be there when they plan to retire. And that's, that's important not only for them, but also for future generations. As, the, as our debt service payment increases, it's going to crowd out our ability to invest in education and transportation in this state. We need pension reform to be able to pay for pencils, to be able to rebuild bridges for the future of this state for the solvency of the state and to help bring Connecticut back to the top economically. Um, to the time keeps, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give both our candidates one more minute on this question. Mr. Needleman, I, I know it's um, certainly not gonna solve the state's budget problem in a minute, but perhaps you could in a minute share you know, one idea you might have for trying to uh, get the state in better fiscal health. Sure. I, I actually agree that new employees should be in um, defined contribution plans and uh, the state should negotiate that and where possible. I've told people that if I was uh, in a different position, because I'm a municipal CEO and the CEO of my own company, um, so I've dealt with budgets, I've built them, I've lived them uh, for my entire career, 37 years in business, 200 employees, and now a town. I would sit all the interested parties down at a table. I would hire the best bankruptcy attorney in the country, and I'd say, come in and read everybody the riot act. We're all in it together. We either solve it together or we go down together. Because I think that a, a come to Jesus moment has to happen for our um, interested parties in the state. So I would, I would work hard to find those solutions. I would. Um, try where we can legally to limit benefits, but I think it's really a matter of controlling spending and increasing jobs. And uh, be fair, I'll give one a minute to Senator Linares uh, if you want to comment further on, on what perhaps could be done in this situation. Controlling spending and ending wasteful spending is something I've fought for for four years. Under Dan Malloy and the democratically controlled legislature, we have seen runaway spending. We have seen millions and hundreds of millions of dollars spent on programs like the busway and tennis courts and $300,000 for a mileage tax. And never once has my opponent reached out to my office to say thank you for voting against that budget or to complain about what's happening in Hartford. All right, thank you. We'll move to the next question, and it's from Brian Hallenbeck to Senator Linares. Uh, Senator, uh, what can the legislature do to accelerate the recovery of jobs lost during the Great Decession, Recession, an area in which Connecticut lags the nation and other New England states, notably Massachusetts? Since the Great uh, Recession, uh, Massachusetts has recovered and gained 270% of their jobs. Connecticut has recovered 80% of their jobs, and that's not good enough. And the reason why is because we haven't been listening to job creators. We have to do a better job of making the regulatory environment more flexible to create growth. In Florida, they they reduced regulations and created a million new jobs. We can do that here. We just need to listen to job creators. We also have, have to get, contr under, get control of our long-term liabilities, our spending, and make sure that we lower taxes today, have a simplified tax code, and when we do have a surplus, we should use that to ratchet down taxes in this state. That'll help our economy grow. That will give us a confident future. And we're not seeing that under Dan Malloy 
and the democratically controlled legislature now. Uh, Mr. Needleman, you have 90 seconds. Thank you. Job. I am a job creator. Through this recession, um, we increased our business by 50% or 40%, I would say, and we increased the number of jobs in Connecticut. We added 50 people. Um, I didn't find anything particularly onerous about that, except for the fact that we do have a skills gap in new employees, and we need to work harder through our community colleges, which I actively support to um, train workers for the future. We manufacture product in the state of Connecticut, and I was ecstatic to hear that, um, that Sikorsky and Electric Boat are both increasing jobs in the state of Connecticut. We can do better, we have to do better, but Connecticut is unique in many ways. We have a bifurcated state with some very wealthy people down in one part of the state and um, less skilled people in our cities. So a lot will happen if we work hard to improve the quality of life in our cities and educate people fairly um, and encourage people to come here, eliminate some fees and taxes on businesses, but it's not the answer completely. I don't find the tax um, system in the state of Connecticut particularly unfair as somebody who employs 150 people in our district. So. Senator Linares, you have another 30 seconds on this one? We have to find a way to make the tax code more attractive for businesses to move to this state. We're hearing from companies that are looking to go to South Carolina or Florida because of the, the burden of taxes in those states are much less. If we can find a way to simplify our tax code, we can drive business to this state. Right now, we're playing defense. We have to be recruiting companies, companies that millennials want to work for, so we can replenish our workforce here in Connecticut. Right now, we're not doing that. Thank you. Um, next question is to Mr. Needleman. Uh, your opponent sponsored a state constitutional amendment that would toughen the requirements for selling or swapping state-owned lands to make way for development. Uh, the amendment would require a two-thirds vote in the legislature to approve such a sale of open space, uh, that the sale or swap would have to be presented as a standalone bill, not part of a, a bigger omnibus package, and that any resulting sale revenues uh, uh, go from the sale, go towards purchasing open space land, if I have that right, and I'm sure if I don't, the Senator will correct me. Um, how, would you, how would you vote on that amendment uh, and why? So I think that that came out of the land swap that happened in Haddam, um, which I thought was um, an ill-conceived uh, deal when it happened, and I um, actually think that um, making those kinds of land swaps standalone is not a bad idea. Um, thank you. Uh, Senator Linares. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> We, were, we are very close to per putting a permanent end uh, to things like the land swap, which was a terrible deal for the Connecticut River Valley. We have one of the most beautiful districts in the country because we take care of our, of our river valley. We make sure that we don't overdevelop on the Connecticut River Valley, and it's an incredible place to visit and it's an incredible environmental victory that we had when we preserved the preserve, when we blocked the Haddam land swap and we put it to an end permanently. And that was something that I was very proud to have accomplished uh, in my four years in the Senate. Um, and can, if I could follow up, Senator Linares, uh, perhaps it came across as a softball question, maybe it did, but I actually got that from a developer who was uh, who had concern that putting it in the Constitution uh, uh, was too much, that it, it, it ended any ability to sort of negotiate and have some uh, wiggle room. So, uh, you know, if you could address that, uh, having, having come from the reader, as why, why you think the Constitution, as opposed to simply a matter of law, uh, is necessary. Well, I think by requiring a two-thirds uh, legislative vote, 
is a great is a great way to protect open space in this state. We take open space very seriously <coughs> in my district. It, when uh, we had a public forum for the high speed rail, uh, the, for the for the public to come in and comment on the high speed rail, this auditorium was full because uh, the feds were proposing running a high speed rail right through. Uh, different open space territory, different historical territory. So we take that seriously, and that's something my district wanted, and we had a lot of support for it, and I hope it's going to pass in the All next right. legislative session. Um, anything more on that, Mr. Needleman? And on, sure. Know. Um, I've been a big supporter of the Land Trust in Essex, which is a very, very active group. We've uh, supported open space acquisitions through our municipal budget, and um, I was very proud to be part of um, the effort to purchase the preserve also. Um, I would uh, wonder, uh, because that money was paid for, there was a significant amount of money in the state budget for that, I wonder if, um, other than verbal support for it, if Senator Linares actually voted for the funding. Um, you can, you'll have time if, on the next question, you want to add that, because uh, the next question is to Senator Linares, uh, and it's from Lisa McGinley. For a number of reasons, including um, increasing emphasis on natural gas as a fuel source, some industry analysts have expressed fears that nuclear energy producers such as Millstone will find it too unprofitable to invest in future operations. They point to nuclear energy as a clean source that operates no matter the weather. Would you support financial incentives or breaks for the Millstone Nuclear Power Station if the General Assembly is asked to consider them? I would take a look at uh, how it would affect our state economically and financially first. I would have to understand the terms and conditions of the deal. And ultimately, we have to be very careful and very cautious about making sure that we, we incentivize Millstone and nuclear power to continue in this state. Otherwise, we can have rolling brownouts, we can have blackouts, and that's a big concern. Energy is the ability to do work. So we, in order for our economy to grow, we have to get that right. And so I think supporting Millstone, supporting nuclear is important. And getting back to my original point on energy, I think that as a, as a country, we have got to have an energy policy that allows competition, that allows uh, different energy sources and companies to compete uh, at, a, at an even playing field. And I think we'll see nuclear and renewables do very well in that environment. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Needleman, on whether or not you would support uh, uh, some financial incentives to help Millstone continue operating in this current environment. So I believe that, at least for the short term, nuclear is a part of a comprehensive energy strategy. Um, I think long term, the risks associated with it need to be weighed against the reward of um, the type of energy it produces. And I hope that uh, renewable energy um, becomes more prevalent so we don't have to rely on it. But in the short term, I think we need Millstone, and I think we need to help Millstone stay viable. Um, one thing uh, that's important to me is, and I think it is to other people, is Senator Linares never um, responded to the question of climate change. Um, I support nuclear because um, it is the least impactful source of energy besides pure renewable energy on the effects of uh, human activity on climate. I believe in climate change. I believe that our activity, our use of fossil fuels, as well as other things we do, impacts the environment. I live with that as first selectmen when we have a hurricane, or we have another series of horrible winters. Or th th There's no doubt in my mind that um, climate change is affecting us. Our emergency preparedness people deal with it all the time. So, um, so I, I reluctantly support Millstone's activity because I believe we need to deal with that now and the loss of their energy would be um, crippling for us. Thank you. Um, and you get another 30 seconds, uh, 30 Senator seconds. Linares. Yeah, and, and I don't She's know timing me. She started. She, well, wait until <laughs> I get my question. <laughs> and, and, uh, it, 
if you want to if you want to clarify your position on climate change, it was the trigger there. <laughs> I didn't even know we had two different. If you want to <laughs> you want to clarify your position on climate change that was raised by your opponent, uh, you could use of this. Of course, I believe in climate change. That's why I started a solar energy company with my brother-in-law, one of my best friends, so that, and we created 76 jobs in Middletown, Connecticut, building solar, 130 megawatts of solar energy across the country in 19 states. We're the fastest growing solar energy company in America right now. Of course I do. It's one of the reasons why I drive an electric car. I don't just talk about it, I act on it. And I'm very proud of what we've done at Green Skies, and we have, the best is yet to come with solving climate change as a country and All right. the yep. thank you man 30 <laughs> seconds <laughs> mom to you <laughs> all right uh, i think we have we're gonna have time probably for one more question uh kind of how it goes and uh it's from brian hallenbeck and it's to mr needleman mr needleman there's a uh, consensus that the opioid epidemic that's ravaging so many towns and, and areas around here and then throughout the northeast, northeast and elsewhere that requires more resources to fight it. Uh, I want to ask, do you have a plan for improving and expanding services, including prevention programs, and how would you go about paying for such programs? So this is a uh, problem that I live with as first selectman every day. Um, I, my cell phone gets all the 911 calls from my town and um, and I see an unconscious, unresponsive call, and I know that that's a pretty high likelihood that it's an overdose. And we've had four or five, we've had m the same person overdose in consecutive days on the narcotics that are around. So of course, I believe we have to fund uh, prevention and we need to continue supplying Narcan to our first responders, which have saved countless lives already. I was on the board of the Rushwood Center, which is a behavioral health and addiction services hospital for eight years, and it's a cause near and dear to my heart. So seeing this upsurge is absolutely terrible, and the deaths relating from the importation of fentanyl and the ingredients to make fentanyl, which are spiking heroin and killing people left and right, I think that this is an area where we need to find money to help fight it at a municipal and a state level. Thank you, Senator Linares. Heroin addiction is a huge issue in Connecticut right now. L&M Hospital had five overdoses in five hours just several weeks ago. It's one of the reasons why the Re Connecticut Republicans proposed legislation to stop the citizens' election program and fully fund mental health services so that uh, we can help rehabilitate folks that are addicted to heroin. When someone gets addicted to heroin, uh, the receptors in their brain that create positive feelings, euphoria, positive feelings, they can't produce them naturally, again, for over a year. It's a very addictive substance, and it's better to invest in re rehab, rehabilitating folks that are addicted uh, than just sending them to jail. Where we do need to be uh, more strict is in terms of how we deal with drug dealers. There is a bill that it, uh, folks are considering proposing, which ultimately if someone deals heroin to an individual that then goes and overdoses on the drug, the dealer uh, can be thrown in jail for manslaughter. Uh, that is a policy that uh, some folks on my side of the aisle are considering proposing in the next legislative session. We have another 30 seconds on this uh, opioid issue, Mr. Needleman. Um, so I lived um, through the 1970s and 80s with the three strikes and you're out, um, unintended consequences of bad legislation. So I'd be reluctant on uh, the last piece of what Senator Lenara said. And I also don't believe that setting up the citizen's election program has a straw man for funding mental health, which costs billions of dollars or hundreds of million for sure is the answer. But we do need to find more money at a, at a state and municipal level. And here the municipalities need to participate. We are bearing the burden of paying for Narcan and all of our um, ambulances and, and it's necessary. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna squeeze one more question. It's sort of a follow-up, it'll begin 
with Senator Linares to our time cues. Why don't we both give him one minute and then I'll move to closing statements on this one. Uh, there's been some proposals in other states that uh, drug, drug companies uh, pay into uh, a fund to help uh, addiction services uh, much like casino ventures now uh, have to pay in to support gambling addiction services. And I was wondering what our uh, candidates might think about uh, making that requirement of the pharmaceutical companies since uh, the problem is often traced to the uh, prevalence of painkillers. And why don't we start with Senator Linares to have a minute and then we'll hear from Senator Needleman. I would be Excuse open. Me, Mr. Yeah. Not I would be open to uh, bringing bringing in the pharmaceutical businesses to talk with them about that, and I think that we can do that only if we would lockbox the funds that go to that program. Like I said before, so often we see money going into the special transportation fund, the use for the general fund, tourism general fund. If that if those funds would go to pay for Re rehabilitation and mental health services, I would be open to discussing that. Thank you. Mr. Needleman? A new tax. So I would, um, I am in the pharmaceutical business. <laughs> I do not make controlled substances for the record. Um, and I'm not sure how you would actually do that. That there are companies that um, make a wide array of products. There's a few that are uh, you know, the people who invented OxyContin, um, a lot of blame is being laid at their feet for marketing the drug so aggressively. And I think that, that the, the marketing of drugs themselves is really the core problem. But not everybody who overdoses from heroin started with painkillers. Some did, some didn't. Um, so I, I don't know that another tax is the answer. I know that the pharmaceutical companies do need to be part of the solution. And, um, and I would welcome them being part of the conversation. All right, thank you. Now we're going to our closing statements. Each candidate will have a minute to uh, uh, sum up. And uh, by a flip of the coin, we're going to start with Senator Linares. Connecticut needs a goal. We need a vision. We need new leadership. Our goal should be to take Connecticut to the top. We should be the, pl the best state in the, in the country to start a business, to buy a home, to raise a family. That should be our goal. Unfortunately, under six years of Dan Malloy and the democratically controlled uh, state legislature, we've seen Connecticut move backwards. Connecticut Republicans have a plan for a confident future. That's actually the name of our plan. I encourage you to check it out. We're going to make it easier for, business, for job creators to grow their business in this state, for uh, schools to count on their education because we're going to get our budgets done earlier. Connecticut Republicans, and especially Senate Republicans, have a future, a, for, have a plan for a confident future in Connecticut, and it's time for a change. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, last word, Mr. Needleman. Sure. I would like to thank our hosts and all of you who attended tonight's debate. It is unfortunate that my opponent has characterized me repeatedly as a straw man for Dan Malloy. Nothing could be further from the truth. Let me tell you who I am. I started as a cab driver in New York and now own a manufacturing company that employs over 200 people. I began as a volunteer commissioner and now serve as Essex First Selectman. I have paid my dues and have a desire to continue serving where my skills are needed. I have the judgment, temperament, and problem-solving skills that have allowed me to be a successful leader in both the public and private sector. That's why I've been endorsed by both Republican and Democratic First Selectmen. Relationships mean everything to me. Profit is not my only motivation for being in business, and glory has no role in my desire to be a public servant. Improving people's lives is at the core of who I am. If you vote for me, I assure you I will be a credible voice for our district, always telling you the truth and not reverting to scripted talking points. Um, thank you. Thank you.
that concludes our debate. Uh, it will remain available on theday.com. People that uh, maybe get mentioned, if people didn't see it, they could check it out. I thank the audience for being so respectful and urge everyone to vote November 8th. Good night.